order. I call this meeting of the Public Accounts Committee to order. I would like to remind everyone to place their phones on silent uh, so we do not have interruptions today. We'll start with introductions, uh, beginning with Mr. McKay. Good morning and welcome. I'm Hugh McKay, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Good morning, Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Benjamin Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft, Lunenburg. Good morning and welcome, Gordon Wilson, the MLA for Claire Digby. Good morning, welcome. My name is Tim Houston, I'm the MLA for Picto East. Morning, Dave Wilson, MLA for Sackville Cobbequid. And Lisa Roberts, the MLA for Halifax Needham. Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness, and your chair. We have the Office of the Auditor General with us this morning, Mr. Spicer. Terry Spicer, Deputy Auditor General. So this morning we have uh, the Department of Business with us as a witness. We are discussing the economic development and employment trends in the Nova Scotia film industry. Um, I'd like to give our, our witnesses an opportunity to introduce themselves and we will begin on my right. Uh, Ray Lemke, I'm a strategist within the Department of Business. And I'm Bernie Miller, I'm the Deputy Minister of the Department of Business. Linda Wood, Manager of Film and Television Incentives, Nova Scotia Business Inc. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Wood, you may proceed with opening comments. I'm sorry, Mr. Miller, I'm sorry. Quite all right, thank you, and I <laughs> appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, the subject of today's meeting is economic development and employment trends in Nova Scotia's film industry. Uh, in commenting on that, I'll be referring to and using some of the most current data uh, that we have available. <clears throat> Uh, Nova Scotia is one of two jurisdictions in Canada which has both public support programs for the film and TV industry and an actual budgeted surplus. According to Profile 2017, and Profile 2017 is an annual production of the Canadian Media Producers Association, uh, the Department of Canadian Heritage, and Telefilm Canada. Uh, and according to them, total production volume in the province of Nova Scotia, and this is adding all production types, uh, was higher in 2016-17 than it was in five of the last ten years. And it's now nearing substantially the same volume as uh, the ten-year average from 2007 until 2017. The other uh, piece of information from Profile 2017 is every province involved in foreign and location service productions uh, did see an increase in activity over the previous year, that would be the 2015-16 uh, year, and Nova Scotia was up uh, more than 200% year over year, and that's compared to a 23% year over year increase in Ontario. Uh, just a, a quick comment on the data source. Uh, the CMPA and Heritage Canada and Telefilm Canada cooperate to produce an annual profile of uh, the national industry. Uh, they do rely on data from CAVCO, and CAVCO is the Canadian Audiovisual Certification Office. It's an office of Heritage Canada, uh, and CAVCO works with the Canada Revenue Agency to verify film and TV uh, industry federal credits. Uh, so in our view, it is a useful source for data for interprovincial comparisons. Uh, but I would point out that there are various data sources uh, for, the, for the film industry. So uh, you may have other, other data available to you. Uh, my remarks are uh, related to the uh, CAVCO uh, CMPA data. Uh, today in my remarks, I, pr I, I plan to provide information on uh, the background uh, on government's policy objectives related to this sector, being the, the film and TV uh, sector as a, a subcomponent of the culture and creative sector. And we uh, at the Department of Business are very, very grateful uh, for the collaboration of Screen Nova Scotia and all the other industry participants who uh, helped shape this policy framework. Uh, we intend to continue this engagement uh, as we seek to always make continuous improvements to our programming. 
In short, our objective at the Department of Business is to grow our film and TV production industry within a sustainable fiscal framework. Uh, we work collaboratively with the industry and its members to maintain a competitive sector, and we want to work with industry to improve and increase areas where there is a distinct competitive advantage and a lasting benefit for Nova Scotians. More broadly, to put it in the context of our overall approach to economic development, we want to encourage innovation, creati creativity, and unique competitive advantage. Uh, the Department of Communities, Culture, and Heritage also plays a role in supporting the industry and its emerging artists. Uh, this calendar year, CCH introduced the Screenwriters Development Fund, a $262,000 fund with the goal of increasing Nova Scotia content in film industry by supporting local screenwriters and producers. The fund also encourages diversity and gender parity within the industry. I'd also note that uh, the province through CCH invests an additional 238,000 annually into Screen Nova Scotia to ensure the industry has a dedicated film industry partner uh, with whom uh, NSBI and the Department of Business uh, uh, consultant deal with regularly. NSBI has export programs and other ge general business growth initiatives which are available to the industry and of course government uh, uh, general programming to support workforce attachment uh, initiatives such as the Graduate to Opportunity program would also be uh, something to which the industry would be eligible. Uh, the province continues to regularly engage with Screen Nova Scotia and other stakeholders as we look to how we can grow this part of our creative economy and will work to maintain and enhance the overall competitive competitiveness of the industry. Just a few words on the background and context for the industry in Nova Scotia uh, and to provide some useful information to you, I'll commence with a very brief history of Nova Scotia's provincial incentive program to encourage film and TV production. And this is not to imply that film production in Nova Scotia only started with the introduction of public spending through a tax credit program. In fact, uh, the very first feature film in Canada was a Nova Scotia production. It was by the Canadian Bioscope Company, and they produced Evangeline uh, in uh, uh, roughly 105 years ago. Uh, it was a critical and financial success. Uh, so that was uh, really the, the start of the film industry in Canada, and it started here in Nova Scotia. Uh, but you'll be pleased to know that the rest of my remarks will focus on more recent history. Uh, public expenditures uh, to support film and TV production in Nova Scotia date back to 1995, and that was with the introduction of the first film industry tax credit on the at the provincial level. In 1995, the film tax credit was for labour expenditures, and it was a 32.5% uh, subsidy with a cap on production on eligible costs. By 2014-15, the credit had increased to a maximum of 65% of eligible labour. Um, just to recap, over that 20-year period, the tax subsidy increased uh, by, uh, it doubled in that 20-year period. So throughout the period from 1995 to 2017, Nova Scotia has consistently been between 1 and 2% of the share of the Canadian film and tele television production volume although on average uh, total production volume has been gradually declining in Nova Scotia since about 2000. In the last two years, total production has seen a gradual incline, but the makeup of production types has changed. In 2016-17, that was a good year for production, and moving forward, production demand under the development fund looks strong. Uh, as we speak with stakeholders and other interested uh, members in this industry, it's important to remember that Nova Scotia's film industry and indeed Canada's film industry is cyclical and somewhat volatile in the short term. And we need to be careful in considering not just year-over-year -year activity but the longer-term trends. Year-to-year -year changes can be influenced by one-time circumstances. Uh, an example would be a significant change in the value of the Canadian dollar, uh, which influences foreign producers in choosing to come to uh, Canada. If the Canadian dollar were to be at parity or higher, that could have an impact. Uh, and so that's an illustration of how the industry can be uh, cycl 
cyclical. Now, when we look at the longer term information, we know our total production volume has remained somewhat constant at between 1 and 2 percent of Canadian total production volume. In the 14 year period from 2000 to 2014, annual production volume was on average about $115 million per year, according to, uh, in this case, PwC, and $105 million per year, according to the CMPA uh, information I was referring to. In 2016 and 2017, which is the most recent year we have full data on, the total volume of production was essentially at the 14-year average of about $100 million. We recognize that film and TV productions account for a small proportion of our GDP, less than 1% in Nova Scotia. However, these, uh, we also recognize the importance of these jobs and the, and the opportunity to the, the people that work in the industry and the value, the skills uh, of this workforce uh, contribute to the Nova Scotia economy. Although many of the jobs in the industry are almost by definition short term and episodic, Film jobs help build the resiliency needed for a gig economy. In fact, the film industry may be the original gig economy. The industry builds adaptability. It provides transferable skills, which may be crucial as the economy evolves and the future of work changes. In fact, almost 61% of the workers in the Nova Scotia industry, according to the PwC report, were independent contractors or freelancers. Uh, just a few words about industry trends. The industry itself is undergoing transformation as consumer media consumption patterns change. Uh, people now consume their, uh, their, their media content in many ways, including their smartphones, their computer screens, their television screens, and theatrical film screens. Uh, the internet and online sources are disrupting the traditional business models and traditional industry patterns. But the fortunate aspect of this is for those involved in content production, what is emerging is actually a global expansion in demand for content. Now, competition for work in the film industry value chain is global and quite competitive. Although the North American industry was originally concentrated in Hollywood, it is now much more dispersed throughout North America. In Canada, British Columbia, Ontario, Alberta, Manitoba, Newfoundland, and Quebec, which is essentially French language productions, are the primary competitors for film production activity. Uh, BC and Ontario are also quite heavily involved in other aspects of the industry value chain. So there's production, there's distribution, and other elements of the value chain. And Ontario and Quebec have a greater uh, breadth of involvement in the um, other parts of the value chain. And they also have extensive infrastructure and industry clusters. Some of the key competitive factors that bear on, on uh, the competitiveness of a jurisdiction are infrastructure, talent, locations, economies of scale, input costs, and then finally incentives. Uh, Nova Scotia participates in the industry primarily in the film and TV production component of the value chain and less so in distribution activities and other activities further up the value chain. Our competitive advantages are talent and locations. Our local producers are particularly important for the film and TV industry and our locations are outstanding. Uh, a few words on production types and trends. The industry can generally be broken down into four main production types. Uh, now these categories are subject to change as the industry evolves, but the typical production types are foreign location and service productions, TV production, broadcast production, and Canadian theatrical film production. And I'll comment on each component of production activity and, and uh, Nova Scotia. So according to the Canadian Media Producers Association, or CMPA, there, are significant, there has been significant growth in Canada in foreign location service production since 2013, as the Canadian dollar declined relative to the US dollar, thus making Canada, and particularly BC and Ontario, more attractive to large foreign service productions. 
The CMPA reported in its 2017 industry report, that's the most recent report, that Nova Scotia had an over 200% over increase in foreign service and production values from 2015-16 to 2016-17. Uh, in numerical terms, it went from 12 million uh, to 39 million and 39 million would be the highest value of foreign service production since 2009-10. For Canadian television, um, production in Nova Scotia saw a decrease in the volume of activity between 2015-16 to 2016-17 of $6 million, going from 43 million to 37 million. Nova Scotia has 1% of national TV volume and is fifth behind Ontario, Quebec, BC, and Alberta. Uh, for Canadian theatrical film production, according to CMPA data, we've seen a declining trend uh, that really started around 2007. And that declining trend from then to date goes from a uh, production high of 11 productions in 2010-11 uh, to no productions in 2014-15 uh, prior to the introduction of the new fund with a slight recovery up to three in 2015-16 and one in 2016-17, and, and I'll, I'll add that that data is from the CMPA data, and uh, uh, there may be other data that, um, that uh, would provide additional insights into the trends in Canadian theatrical film production. Uh, but overall, the, the, the uh, decline in Canadian theatrical film productions would follow a national trend. Uh, where we've seen three years of decline in the total numbers of Canadian theatrical film productions. Finally, in 2015-16 to 2016-17 time frame, we saw a very slight decrease in broadcaster in-house production activity from 25 million to 23 million. Uh, broadcaster in-house would be, for example, CBC productions. Employment trends. So, Industry employment trends will be affected by several factors, particularly the type of production. So the curse of Oak Island will have a different employment profile compared to a television miniseries like The Book of Negroes. Documentaries and variety and performing arts productions will usually not require abundant ACTRA members, while foreign service productions may favor the number of IATSE members that become involved. It's also important to note that employment levels fluctuate from year to year in the industry and that in 2015-16 and 16-17, those numbers were headed in a positive direction. Despite that, FTE employment has not regained the levels that existed in the 2001 to 2013 period, which may be attributable to changing patterns of production activity in Nova Scotia particularly as in the longer term trends, local production makes up a, a larger proportion of our, of our industry relative to foreign and location service productions. In general, lo lo local productions or Nova Scotia owned productions have a higher economic value to Nova Scotia. Uh, that said, we know that producers of larger foreign service productions continue to do business hit here, uh, like The Mist uh, and Lighthouse, which is currently filming here in Nova Scotia. Um, I'd like to just uh, wrap up with a few comments about the incentive fund itself that was introduced in July of 2015. The incentive does not cause productions to occur, but is one of five or six competitive factors which can influence production location decisions and lead a producer to select Nova Scotia as a location for film or TV productions. Other factors are talent, infrastructure, studios, sound stages, type of production. For example, BC would have an advantage in foreign service due to their proximity to Hollywood, their time zones, their infrastructure, their industry relationships, and that in some ways explains why they have 36% of the national industry. The policy of the film industry tax credit seemed to be to seek to offset our competitive challenges with a nationally higher level of subsidy. However, from 2000 to 2014, we still saw a downward trend in production volume from the region, suggesting the former policy was not optimal. I would suggest the solution lies not just in adjusting the subsidy, but in collaborating with participants in the industry to focus our attention on those aspects of the industry where Nova Scotia can build on its existing competitive advantages and offset weaknesses by making strategic investments and also further building on our competitive advantages of talent and locations. 
One of the criticisms of the film industry tax credit was that it did not specifically incent the use of Nova Scotia talent, uh, particularly actors in principal roles. In consultation with ACTRA and others, a specific Nova Scotia content incentive was added to the new program to address this gap. The Nova Scotia content incentive pays a 1.5% bonus if a production has 60% of all principal performers, actors, and stunt performers as Nova Scotians. An additional 1.5% bonus is available for any three of having Nova Scotia copyright owner, Nova Scotia trainees, Nova Scotia post-production, total spend in Nova Scotia being greater than 75% of total production costs, having a Nova Scotia writer, a Nova Scotia director, a Nova Scotia producer. In other words, any production that has any three of those elements is entitled to bonus uh, uh, subsidy under the funding program. While these bonus elements were initially resisted by some producers, ultimately a consensus was reached that the benefit of these incentives should be shared with and extend to Nova Scotia-based talent as well as producers. If one of the objectives is to improve our competitive advantage, one area to explore is how do we uh, increase the scope of these Nova Scotia content incentives to build that aspect of the industry. Now looking at the changing pattern of production, there does seem to be an increase in uh, Nova Scotia local production as a percentage of total production activity and this would actually be in line with the policy objectives. I've closed with just a, a comment or two on the cultural industries more broadly. According to Stats Canada in 2016, there were 13,719 culture jobs in Nova Scotia. This was a 4.9% year-over-year increase, and the rate of growth of culture jobs in Nova Scotia was faster than job growth in the broader economy. For our new economy, an economy that sees value in creativity, exploration, research, innovation, and growth of culture jobs bodes well for Nova Scotia's future, and that is a trend that we at the Department of Business will seek to accelerate uh, with participants in the cultural sector. Thank you. Mr. Houston, you have 20 minutes. Mr. Houston, the PC Caucus. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, there's a lot of numbers in the presentation. Just a couple numbers I didn't hear, though and that is the amount of the, of the um, incentive, I guess, that the province, that the province uh, invests in the industry. The province used to invest about 25 million under the old system up to 2014, and we know the volume that was, that was generated by that investment, or at least partly attributed to that investment. How much uh, was invested in, in the last year, and how much will be invested this year? So, um Going back, I'll answer the latter part of your question first. The, the current year budget allocation is $20 million uh, in NSBI's budget, uh, which is built on the forecast of need for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, in the time the fund has been in place, uh, the fund has approved 91 productions and approximately $40 million in government spending uh, has, has uh, government funding has occurred. Uh, so how much? How much last year? Just last year. <clears throat> Mr. Miller, <clears throat> last year's. Um, uh, expenditures in the fund were 22 million. So, at the time, under the old um, regime, I guess the last the last year was 25 million. And um, I know you quoted the Pricewaterhouse Coopers analysis of 115 million volume. There was a lot of the former finance minister disputed that <laughs> to no ends of the earth. But uh, is it now accepted that, um, that that 25 million investment in the industry was generating economic activity in excess of $100 million? Um, for, for which year are you referring? The 2014. The 2014 year. That, that's the particularly troubling year to get accurate data. Uh, CAVCO and CMPA uh, does not... They have you quoted the... You referenced the Price Waterhouse uh, as, 100, as 115 million volume for that year. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. But what was 
for the total production volume in 2014-15. Mr. Miller? We, we have three different data, data points on that. We have a CMPA number, which has an asterisk on it, and 69 million of production, which we don't think is an accurate number in that particular case. Uh, we have the, um, uh, the PricewaterhouseCooper uh, report, which was 139 million. And then the data that we have says it's anywhere between 120 and 180 is where the actual number is. Okay. Okay, and and for the budget for the budget for this year, twenty million dollars. How much how much volume will that generate? It's forecast to be in the hundred million plus range. Okay, here's my problem: a hundred and twenty or twenty five million dollar investment generated economic activity according to Price Waterhouse of 139 million according to the department somewhere between 120 and 180 million 25 million led to that much economic activity and now after after everything 20 million this year is going to lead to a significantly reduced number of economic uh, activity you're spending as much as was ever spent fewer people are working and the industry is smaller. That's the problem here. Um, do you accept that that's a problem? Well, j just f first, the, the phrase economic activity, uh, it, it's production volume uh, that we're referring to rather than economic activity. Uh, the, uh, the question, I guess, um, <clears throat> assumes that the intention is merely to reduce the the total level of support to the industry. In fact, the intention was to uh, provide a competitive uh, fund that would also see, uh, you know, certain policy objectives being pursued, such as the Nova Scotia content elements that I referred to. Uh, and in addition, by shifting from a labor-based fund to a, an all-spend uh, kind of pr production in Nova Scotia-based fund, it was to see that the benefit of the subsidy was incenting the use of goods and services outside of uh, only labour. Uh, the, the other aspect is really the context of why shift from the tax credit to the fund. Uh, and the context was that in, in um, 2014, the government head of, of, or the province of Nova Scotia had a $14.9 billion debt level. Uh, the 2013 deficit was about $300 million. The 2014 forecast de deficit was $250 million. Um, the uh, Finance and Treasury Board had conducted a full program review, uh, and they concluded that the film industry tax credit was open-ended and back-ended, back-end loaded in the sense that uh, applications would be made, but the actual liability was not known in the current year and in some cases was not known for many years, so it was a very open-ended uh, multi-year commitment and it was not subject to forecast. Um, the government of the day was looking at the investments needed in health, education, community services, saw that debt service was the fourth highest category of expenditure. So it was to save money. Pardon me? So it was, you can't have both ways. You can't say it wasn't to save money and then provide analysis that shows it was to save money. Yeah, no, the, I guess if, the, we, if the, we cut through all that though, and I, 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 uh, I had the benefit of being in this chamber for hours of discussion on this topic with the, with, the, with the minister and it was clear to me, the change was to save money. It was a $25 million investment that became a $10 million fund. 
So we can't rewrite the history on that, but we, we, I guess we can, I'd like for us to look objectively at the results of the change. Yeah. And, and, and to look at the results of the change, I only need to look at the, at the numbers that were provided today. Yeah. The province is pretty much investing as much money as it ever did. And that, and in return, the taxpayers of the province are getting smaller, uh, reduced economic activity. We're getting less bang for the buck. The industry is smaller. Fewer people are working. The infrastructure that we had is disappearing because there's fewer people working. The change hurt the industry. And by hurting the industry, the change hurt the province. That's the numbers that are before me, despite there's hundreds of numbers provided in your presentation. I appreciate that. But when I cut through all the noise, those are the numbers that matter to me. Do you accept that the industry is smaller today than it was in 2014? No. The, you don't accept that? No. The, the, so, the, and and the on, what, on what basis would you... Let's, let's go through that. That's yeah. an important, that's an important uh, revelation for me. Do you believe there are more people working in the industry today in Nova Scotia than there were in 2014. That, that, that wasn't your question. Your, well, que your well, question gonna, was the size of the industry. Well, let me the define maybe. Had, maybe I can define and we can have some clarity on my... my or, or the member has asked a very clear <coughs> question about the number of people working in the industry. As chair, I wish to hear an answer. Mr. Yeah. Uh, Miller. So, um, according to the CMPA data, uh, the data would say otherwise. Uh, that there, there, there's a, in the in the 20. Oh, Mr. Houston, I just want to be very clear. My my question was: Is the industry smaller or bigger? And and, and I and okay. you and and that, the answer was that it's not smaller, so that implies it's bigger. Now I want to go through some criteria as to how. So my definition of the industry uh, size would be how many people are working would be a key a key cri criteria for me. And, and the economic activity uh, that's generated by the investment would be a second key criteria. We've already established from your own numbers uh, that the volume is smaller. So that's not, that's not a bigger industry, that's a smaller industry on your number of volume by the numbers that you've presented forward to me today. So I, I now want to move to the other criteria I had, which is how many people are working in the industry? Because if it's a growing industry, more people should be working. So my, my specific question is, is there more people working in the industry today than there was in 2014 in the department's view? I know the real world, real world view, but in the department's view, is there more people working today in the industry than there was in 2014? Uh, the, the, it, there's a couple of questions there. One, the, the question was volume. And my point in my remarks was the volume of industry activity in the current year uh, according to CMPA, at 100 million, is the same volume as the average 10-year volume. So, from a volume point of view, the industry, comparing the most recent data we have available with the 10 years preceding uh, any change to the tax credit, the volume is comparable. So that is the first reason why I couldn't agree with your comment. The, no, the second, I, I agree, if I could just second, order, order will allow uh, Mr. Miller to. Answer. The second question has to do with employment, which is distinct from the size of the industry. And employment is determined by a range of factors, including production types. Uh, probably production type has the biggest influence on employment. Um, and when we look at empl employment uh, in the industry, what I see and what the, what the data the, the Department of Business has is when we compare 2015-16, to 2016-17, the level of employment is increasing and has increased. It has uh, reached some of the same levels that existed in previous years, but as I said, employment is, is cyclical. A fund, the creation of a fund or the elimination of a fund, or the elimination of a fund uh, that wasn't replaced would impact, but I cannot say uh, any change to the fund causes job losses. Uh, we need to consider the base year. And if the base year is unusually high, uh, higher than average, then there'll always be a regression to the mean. 
Uh, so what might appear to be a job loss <clears throat> is not a job loss, it's a regression to a mean. So that's why in my opening remarks I said it's important to look at the not long term and not just pick years. I, I was the leader of a law firm for a while and we had an exceptionally good year in 2006. In, and so the total number of hours worked <clears throat> in the business was very high in 2006. In 2007, uh, we had what I would call an average year. It wasn't a bad year, but it was a re regression to what would be a normal year, and our total number of hours worked in the business <clears throat> decreased that year. Uh, but it wasn't caused by anything other than a regression to the mean. So the film industry is the same. The FTEs declined. Uh, if I look at 2006 7 uh, for the film industry, the jobs in, the, in that year in the film industry declined by over 40% in 2006 to 2007. Comparing 2009 to 2010, there was a year-over-year 45% decline. If we don't look at successive years, we can see the decline even appears more pronounced. So comparing 2012 to 2008, Thank one, you. one would be left with the impression Thank you there was for that was a 45% I appreciate, 45 I appreciate that. And, and, you know, statistics, right? We, you, you quoted 105 years ago when the first film was, and you could, you could go back, uh, we could go back 106 years and say, well, wow, what a big spike between the one, you know, I mean, but the reality of it is, is that uh, this is an industry that was uh, hitting stride. It was hitting stride, it was gaining momentum, was performing at a, at a high level. It's a runner running in the 50, uh, 50 yard uh, sprint. And just as they hit their peak, uh, their peak speed halfway through, it tripped. So, so one could say, well, when they got back up, it took them 10 meters to get back up to speed, and that was the regression to the mean. But that's not what happened here. What happened here was when the, when the runner hit peak speed, somebody stuck their foot in front of them and tripped them. And then as they tried to get themselves back up and get back up to speed, the same person who put their foot in front of them said, well, look at that. Look at that. They're picking up speed again. They didn't need to be tripped in the first place. So um, if, if, if the position of the department is, is that um, the hours worked in 2014 was just an anomaly. It's an overly good year, and it was bound to be a regression to the mean. If that's the position, and that the, the hours went from, for the Itatsi numbers went from 2014, 350,000 hours worked, went all the way down to 139,000 in 2015. That's what happens when somebody sticks their foot in front of you, and you trip, you fall on the course. Then they started to come back up, back up to speed. If the, if the department is advancing the position, that the, that the difference between 350,000 person hours in 2014 down to 139,000 in 2015 is just an inconvenient uh, happening, an inconvenient consequence of life beyond the change. I don't agree with that. The change was somebody sticking their foot in front of the runner. And to, to try and describe it as just anything else is, is it's, it's almost a bit laughable, to be honest. And, and the knock-on effect from that continues to, continues. In your opening comments, you said that, you know, the incentive is one element. Sure it is. And the other elements are talent and infrastructure. But guess what? By sticking the foot in front on the incentive, you've hurt our talent. It's leaving. You've hurt our infrastructure. It's closing down. So the things are, they're all interrelated. And um, it's interesting for me now to, to revisit this years later and to hear a position advance, well, we didn't, our change, our policy change didn't impact the industry. So if I could addre address that point, um, the, the observations I was intending to make, if one looks at the data, one can find uh, variations throughout the long-term cycle uh, where there has been declines in total hours worked, where there's been no change to the policy or programming that occurred. So the, the uh, premise of the question and the suggestion that there was an event that tripped the industry is something that um, the data doesn't fully support, but I, I will come back to some qualifications to that. The, 
2006-2007 decline uh, was an example I was using sim simply to illustrate that um, industry dynamics are variable and, and one has to be cautious with precise year-over-year -year comparisons. As, as I did, I said if we look at the more recent years than the years you're referring to, if we look at 15-16 to 16-17, we, we see using 15 as the base year jobs are increasing. <clears throat> but I'm not coming here and saying that's the only story. I'm saying that one has to look at uh, the, the numbers in totality. But there's a couple of other points on, on the policy of the fund. If, if the premise of the question is the introduction of the fund involved tripping the industry, I would say Alberta has a, a fund which is in all material respects similar uh, to the Nova Scotia fund and they've seen job growth with some minor variation since they've had a fund. Um, but I, I would add two qualifications. Uh, uh, the first qualifications I would make is the lower overall payment producers to, uh, payment to producers from the fund, if we compare that to the former tax credit, which was the highest in Canada, that could result in people shopping for the lowest cost jurisdiction. Or another way of putting it, the highest subsidy, regardless of other factors like location or talent, could cause a producer to choose a jurisdiction will pay, that will pay them more for filming there. And this could affect employment levels, particularly for foreign, foreign and location service productions. Uh, the second is, uh, I would agree that there was a period of adjustment that occurred after the fund was introduced, and that could have been a factor. But it wasn't the policy design of the fund per se, but there was a period of, of adjustment. And I'd add finally that the type of productions, which is not directly caused by the fund, but could be influenced by the fund, uh, could be a factor. Uh, so, ex for example, uh, to the extent that the fund encourages Nova Scotia indigenous productions from uh, local producers at a higher level than foreign service productions could result in foreign service producers choosing a jurisdiction that will pay them more to film there. Order. Time has expired. We'll move to the NDP caucus. Ms. Roberts. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to restate some numbers because there were a lot of numbers flying during your exchange with Mr. Houston. So I have that in the last full year of the of the film tax credit, the provincial expenditures were 23.5 million, and that in 2016, 2017, the amount spent on film incentives was 22 million. Those numbers look sound right to yeah. you? Okay, thank you. Um, the numbers from the Directors Guild and IATSE 849 show that the total numbers worked by their members in the film industry have dropped dramatically since the cancellation of the tax credit and the switch to the incentive fund. Um, more than 60% reduction in hours worked compared to the last year of the labor-based tax credit. I accept your point, numbers vary year to year for many different reasons, but does it concern you that the province is spending the same amount in subsidies with much worse returns in terms of jobs? Uh, the, again, the, the premise of the question uh, has to be put in context. The film industry tax credit paid well after the production occurred and there was a significant tail on payments made under the film industry tax credit. And just to illustrate that point, in the most recent fiscal year that's just concluded, we still paid six million under the film industry tax credit. So to compare the, uh, the forecast budget fund uh, for the film industry fund, which is a forward-looking forecast, and merely what we're doing is, is putting in our budget allocation based on the data we have available, our best estimate of what will be required to support the fund, and comparing that to a back-end loaded film industry tax credit where the payouts occur after the production activity has occurred and the liability is, is booked after the production activity has occurred, it just creates uh, two different comparisons. But oh, oh, oh. On, on the jobs point, um, your, your observation is one, I don't, I don't want to leave anyone with the impression that we're not interested in working with the industry and addressing the competitive aspects that will increase uh, employment. And it would concern me if we saw a trend downwards that continued downwards. 
Um, the numbers you quoted, uh, the base year was the year uh, before the change. And if that trend had persisted, I would be concerned. But what we have seen is in the last uh, year, after a year of adjustment, uh, we see uh, total employment increasing. So in the most recent year, total FTEs, according to CMP, uh, CMPA was about 880. And the average for the 10-year period before the change was higher than that, uh, but not so materially higher that it would cause one to think that something uh, fundamental has changed. Okay. You, um, you point out that if we look at production volume, um, in 2016-2017, it was $100 million, and that's at about the 14-year average. Now, in, in your presentation, um, or sorry, in your witness package, there are some stats there for uh, the, the trends in the Canadian industry. And certainly, 2016-2017, they're, they're spiking far above the 14-year the, the average. So we're at the 14-year average and they're, and they're heading up. So there is some divergence happening between what is happening in the industry in Nova Scotia and what is happening across the country at this time of great demand for content. Yes, uh, uh, Ontario and BC in particular are benefiting substantially from the industry clusters that they have, including in particular the infrastructure. And so uh, given uh, we still have 2% of the market as, as we've always had, uh, I think it's, it's, uh, you know, it's uh, good news from that point of view, but in terms of who is benefiting more from foreign location service productions choosing Canada over the long term, um, more of those productions are ending up in Ontario and BC. Uh, but I would suggest that part of that is because of the infrastructure, not necessarily the level of subsidy because the level of subsidy in BC and Ontario would be net lower than what's available here. Okay, well then moving briefly to infrastructure because I have more questions than I will be able to get to. We do know that soundstage space is at a premium across the country and establishing a soundstage in Nova Scotia would be a huge factor in increasing Nova Scotia's competitiveness for large service productions and would also be valued infrastructure for uh, local productions. Um, we don't currently have a soundstage, so is your department working to support the development of a soundstage? stage? We're, we're certainly, uh, we haven't been approached specifically on that, but we have had some discussions with members of the industry and, and to put it in the context of our overall approach to economic development, we believe that strategic economic infrastructure that can support sectors mm -hmm. is, is important. So to shift very quickly to a different a sector, the ocean sector is one that we see potential on and obviously the government was interested in providing support for the Centre for Ocean Ventures and Enterprise as an anchor place in which the private sector could then enhance their competitiveness. So the same principles would certainly be the, the lens through which we looked at these types of questions. Okay. Um, at the same time that the film tax credit um, was was cancelled and, and switched to an incentive fund, the $2 million equity f in equity funding was cancelled. Um, and, and that equity fund really helped local productions leverage other funding from, from broadcasters and other levels of government, other funds. Um, and, and that was key to uh, building and showcasing Nova Scotia talent, and the talent then helps to bring the service productions um, and, and, and other large productions. Uh, many other jurisdictions offer equity funds in addition to their incentive programs. Can you explain why we cut it? Um, the, in, in terms of the, uh, the, the benefit of, of startups and encouraging startups, it's very aligned with our, our thinking as well. Uh, the, the equity program for more mature or established uh, enterprises is less evident, uh, and that would have been a factor in, in the determination, I, I expect, although I don't have precise line of sight on, on, on that. But I, I would say, you know, the, the intention of venture or seed stage support to an early stage enterprise is something of importance to us in our economic development thinking. So the Screenwriters Development Fund is kind of an early step along that lines with the intent of supporting more local content, which then is at the early stage of the kind of development of a production, which will then have beneficial knock-on effects. So 
con conceptually, the idea of early stage um, support, whether it's in the form of equity or otherwise, would be aligned with our thinking. So that is something that you'd be open to considering reinstating for the film industry? Well, the, the suggestion of reinstating versus what I was trying to describe, there, there's a distinction because the, um, the, the, the equity funding program that was available uh, was not targeted in the same way uh, my uh, my intentions, uh, my, my observations of policy intention would be, but c conceptually, rather than saying simply do what we did before, having discussions about how we can support early stage um, productions would be very much on our radar. Okay. The other piece is NSBI um, provides programming uh, broadly, and we'd encourage uh, startups to talk to them or Anovacore, and also the Eastlink uh, fund, which is uh, managed through, it's a private fund, but it's managed by NSBI. That would be available for some level of investment. Okay. Again, recognizing that film production um, across the country and in other jurisdictions um, is going up, and, and we're, we're not at this point catching that wave. Um, the industry says that the $4 million cap on funding acts as a disincentive for larger productions to consider Nova Scotia. And I know that, in fact, in on a case-by-case -case basis, the department has, has made that cap flexible and, and gone beyond it. But why doesn't the department just eliminate the cap from its guidelines? Yeah, so we, we continue to listen to industry on, on these points and have uh, interactive dialogue on it. When we look across... Uh, the national um, uh, um, landscape, we see Newfoundland has a $4 million cap. New Brunswick, which isn't really a player in the industry, has a cap. But Alberta, where, where we've modeled uh, a lot of our policy choices, has, has a cap. But as you pointed out, having uh, the ability to look at uh, net benefit, Alberta has introduced a, a, a different model where they're actually rating and scoring uh, plans that are coming in. I'm not sure if that's something where the industry would be inter interested in going um, rather than kind of a, a, a open to all type of non-government evaluated program. Uh, but, you know, the, sh the short answer to your question is the, the cap, I think, is a prudent um, safeguard, uh, but the, this is the per-production cap. But as has been the practice, having an open dialogue and being able to make appropriate adjustments when necessary makes, makes sense. So I, I think um, rather than just opening it up, uh, which exposes governments, present and future governments, uh, to the risk of open-ended uh, financial commitments, I think it's, it's still prudent to maintain um, some level of cap per, on a per-production basis. And, and what about on, you know, as a total budgeted amount basis? You said that um, we have a budget this year for 20 million, last year we spent 22 million. Does that, you know, for uh, producers looking at Nova Scotia, they might get the impression, oh, well, you know, I think they've probably already spent their total amount. I'll go to another jurisdiction. Uh, is there is there talk of uh, eliminating that sort of the total cap on the on the total line item, or communicating that more clearly to the industry that there that there isn't a cap yeah, if there we, isn't one? It, it's it's a very fair fair question. Um, the, like any budget item, because we've shifted from a tax credit to a a forward looking fund that needs a budget allocation during the budgeting process, the deputy minister of finance and others they want a number. Uh, so that becomes our budget allocation, and we use the best information available to us at the time of budgeting, as we do for most programming, um, to determine what's, what's the appropriate budget number. Um, the characterization of that as being a cap would be a mischaracterization. It's a budget allocation, um, and we'd... we'd want to work with industry to make sure that there's sufficient understanding in the industry um, that if there's a net benefit to Nova Scotia, uh, uh, although the Deputy Minister of Finance would not encourage uh, people to um, uh, exceed their budget allocations, and obviously there's processes and public accounts uh, processes would be one of them to ensure that departments stay within their budget allocation. There, there is, as there always is, uh, an opportunity to have discussion and seek authority for additional spending. Um, I do want to return um, to the to the jobs question, and clearly, um, you know, the film tax credit was a labor tax credit, and so it did incent 
spending on labor. Um, and particularly, I would add um, labor that was higher paid than the Nova Scotia average, uh, employing younger people than the Nova Scotia average, um, people with, with high skills. Um, does your department have any plans to make changes to the incentive fund to support more film and television industry jobs? Um, when asked this in estimates, the minister said he was always open to conversations. Does that mean no conversations have occurred? Or what does that mean? Yeah, um, I would, I think, probably from a career point of view, appropriately echo what my minister has said. Uh, we're we're, we're uh, open uh, to conversations and, and the types of things, and I referred to it in my remarks, of the Nova Scotia content incentive, if uh, what we'd like to do is do an evaluation of that and determine whether it's having the impact it was intended to have, and uh, obviously continue a dialogue, and if there can be adjustments in the, in the uh, way in which the incentive is designed in order to achieve better outcomes, we're always uh, open to improvements. Um, on, on, I guess the uh, the foundation of of the question uh, labor versus production incentive. That's a distinct policy choice. Now, some jurisdictions do offer both, and they allow producers to pick one or the other. Uh, certain jurisdictions, ours in Alberta being. Uh, the, the ones in particular have production incentives only. When, when this program was being developed, there was conversations with the industry and, and producers are very quick to be able to do the math to, to compare a labor-based fund to a production fund and determine for their particular pr production makeup which one is optimal from their point of view. And we want to continue to maintain discussions with the industry to ensure our production incentive process maintains competitiveness in the industry? Uh, currently, the incentive system includes a 2% bonus for shooting in rural parts of Nova Scotia and a 1% bonus for production filming longer than a month. The feedback that we've heard from industry is that 2% is not significant enough to encourage shifting more of the production to rural areas. I would suggest that probably 1% for this, 1% for that, 1% for this. When you're actually engaged in a creative enterprise, you're not, you're not you know, going to be recruiting a, a producer or a lead actor or a, a director based on 1% financing. I, that doesn't seem, or, or you're not going to be choosing the, you know, whether you do a film that is appropriate to shoot in a rural area based on a 2% uh, tax incentive. So I think all of those, um, you know, I think that thinking and, and that program probably reads, needs to be redesigned. However, what we have heard from the industry is that it would be helpful if some of those extra little points could just be rolled into the base so that producers can clearly understand what is available in our jurisdiction versus another jurisdiction. And, and I'm wondering if you would consider that to increase our upfront competitiveness. Uh, that, that suggestion was, was made during the development of the process. The, the concern I had is that w the, the Nova Scotia content incentive was specifically designed to be responsive to ACTRA's desire to incent producers to use Nova Scotia principal talent rather than flying in ta principal talent from Toronto or uh, Los Angeles where there was very, very capable and talented principal actors here in Nova Scotia. And the, the, the concern, just to share it with you directly, would be that if we simply rolled it into one number, the, the ability to use the incentive program for sub-policy objectives like increasing the use of Nova Scotia talent could be lost in the mix. Now, to your, to your other question about the makeup of the incentives and are they achieving the objectives, it's our intention using data uh, to, to continue to assess that and if we reach the conclusion that it's not achieving the outcomes, we're absolutely open to discussing that. I guess where the, where the sticking point would be, would be if it's incremental, new, or it's shifting uh, the incentives within the existing total percentage. And um, you know that that would obviously be the, the subject of further discussion. Our, our desire would be to stay within what we believe is a total competitive overall percentage amount, but move the uh, percentage uh, bonuses in a way that gets the outcomes we want to achieve. 
it may be that the industry's ask would be just increase the uh, incentive overall and the, the fear I would have about that would be a race to the bottom where um, Ontario has reduced its credit, uh, BC has reduced its credit, Manitoba has not reduced their credit, they have a $600 million deficit so they were under a lot of pressure to do it but they chose to take the year to evaluate their programming. Um, but the, the trend in the industry is to scale back the level of support, particularly as the Canadian dollar introduces uh, competitive advantage for foreign service. So um, there, there would be some reluctance on our part to just add, because we'd be following a path where, as I said, the, the, the program was introduced at 35%. By 2014, it was 65%, and, and that would be problematic. Okay. Um, anecdotally, we hear reports that many Nova Scotians in the film and, film and television industry, especially young Nova Scotians, have moved. And it was noted in the Pricewaterhouse Cooper that, that this was a younger demographic, many of whom had come to Nova Scotia from elsewhere, more mobile than most. Unfortunately, when I was going door to door in my constituency, I actually found people with their like bags packed. Um, so has your department done any analysis on the impact of the, of, of the changes in 2014 on the province's goal of youth retention? Um, at, at, a, at a broad level, uh, we believe that investments in culture, creativity, innovation, although it's not exclusively the domain of youth, it is attractive to youth, it's, it's beneficial to our overall objective of increasing retention and also attraction. Uh, so at, at the high level, we're certainly uh, aware of it, and I would include creativity, cultural industries as being part of the mix, so th that's important to us. And um, you know, it, to the extent that data, if it's available, suggests that there are things we can do in the in the film industry that would target youth. For example, the kind of early stage uh, type of work that we're talking about, we're certainly open to having discussions. As you mentioned, some other jurisdictions have a partial labor incentive and a partial production bo production volume based incentive. Yeah. Do you see see a way that a labor um, a labor incentive could work for your department? Because what I'm hearing from, from your overall remarks is that the old system was, was difficult for the Department of Finance because, because it did pay out over a number of years. So I'd be interested to hear if there's any labor incentive that you see could work uh, for the Department of Finance if that is the test that uh, film, film incentives need to pass through. Order. Yeah. I am sorry, there won't be time to answer that question, perhaps in the next round. Uh, Mr. Gordon Wilson. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, just to start off, I, I do believe this is the first appearance, Mr. Miller, uh, at public accounts. Uh, that wasn't noted, but I'd like to welcome you. Uh, as you've already experienced, this is an, an interesting place to sit. Uh, I'm one that likes to listen to answers uh, more than uh, go into preambles. So uh, I have a few questions that I certainly think um, are pertinent. I also want to note that uh, uh, my understanding of the, uh, of the film tax credit and the events that uh, have gone on over the years are uh, I guess from, an, from a different opinion, a different world, uh, from my writing Claire Digby, um, it, it really wasn't a, a large topic, so I, I, I have what I feel is a very unbiased opinion of how things rolled out, and, and it's, it's very interesting to see uh, the complexities, uh, to say the very least, of how um, this industry across Canada, uh, I must give a compliment to the, to the staff, the briefing package that we received on this was, was extremely informative. Um, a lot of good comparisons of, of what goes on across, across Canada. And uh, I also must say that uh, your understanding of it being, I believe you're new in the position, uh, not, too, uh, not too long is, is commendable. Um, in, in, in saying that, you know, when we look at the, um, I guess the, I wrote down one thing here, it's a, there's a complex number of suites, there are incentives that are across Canada, uh, and to try and compare one to the other, uh, throw into that the mix of data that's out there on, you know, whether it's jobs you're creating or whether it's direct money that's going into the industry or whether it's, it's uh, impact on, on um, employment directly or to production. 
it's hard to compare apples and apples, and I, and I was surprised to see uh, my, my counterpart, who's an accountant, be challenged with that data. Usually he loves the data. Uh, can you give me an idea uh, what, in regards to factors uh, that drive jurisdictional competitiveness uh, in this sector? So I'm talking across Canada. Well, what do other provinces, including us, take into consideration when we're making these major decisions on how best to spend our, our, our funds? Yeah. Mr. Miller? So, what one, one has to, I guess, start with what's your overall objectives as, as a province and uh, how do you um, use the limited resources you have uh, to maximize the benefits for the province. So that kind of the, the, the first point. And, and recognize there's an opportunity cost to every expenditure. So every uh, investment in an industry uh, such as the film industry also has to be put in the context of um, of what are you not able to fund with the, the same resources. So that's the starting point. And considering what's your competitive advantage in that industry. And as I mentioned, uh, although it, it was a long time ago, Nova Scotia had a film industry a long time ago. And, and starting in 1995, we explicitly started to develop the film industry in, in Nova Scotia as a 2% component of a national uh, film production um, environment. The federal government around 1980 got interested in cultural industries and how do we deal with what at the time was Hollywood's monopoly position on the film industry. Uh, Hollywood ran the industry in North America, so Canada made a decision in the 70s, 80s and 90s that they would start to support that and provinces followed suit. But not all provinces are created equal. Uh, British Columbia, as I mentioned, because of their proximity to Hollywood, was maybe a, a first point of entry for major foreign service productions. And choosing to go head to head with British Columbia on major foreign service productions would be bad policy, in my opinion, uh, because we would lose every time unless we were able to offset our competitive disadvantage with uh, sufficient taxpayer money, which, which doesn't make sense. But looking at those aspects of what it is about Nova Scotia that has distinct competitive uh, advantages, and I think our creativity, our talent, the, the culture, the people, the people in the industry, the resilience of the people in the industry, that's a competitive advantage. Second is our locations. Um, we uh, are uh, you know, a beautiful province with lots of unique uh, locations for filming and if uh, you know, some, some films would want to film here specifically because of our location, there's a production underway called Lighthouse that's being filmed now. We're, we're going to get that work. Alberta's not going to get that work. They don't have as many lighthouses as we do. Uh, so, so location be a second part of it. Um, and play to your strengths would be, be the area, but also always in, in the context of what's your opportunity cost? What are you not doing because you're investing in this particular industry? Thank you. Just, just one other quick question. I have some anxious colleagues here that I'm going to pass on to uh, Mr. McGuire, but uh, will we ever be able to compete with the likes of Ontario and British Columbia? Uh, not if we try to compete with them in exactly the same way they're doing the industry. We, we, we should recognize our unique strengths and focus our attention on those. And building our indigenous local productions would be part of it, as opposed to trying to compete directly with Ontario or BC, which in, in, in uh, BC's case, there's 36% of the national market, and Ontario is 35% of the national market. Uh, on, uh, Quebec is 21% of the national market, so and Quebec has got, because of language, a monopoly on French language production. So really, like any industry, the dominant player is going to get the dominant amount of the work, and those three provinces are the dominant players. Thank you very much. Mr. McGuire. <clears throat> Thank you for he being here today. And I, I want to first start off by saying that uh, I think we all can agree that the film industry is an important uh, industry for, for Nova Scotia, not just from an economic standpoint, that's the thing that some people tend to concentrate on, but also from a cultural standpoint. It's important for Nova Scotians to be able to tell their story, especially on a world stage. We just had an individual... Order. Mr. McGuire, could you pull your mic down? 
First time I've ever been told I'm too quiet. Uh, but we just had an individual here um, not too long ago who, who came to the legislature with an Oscar, which is something we should all be proud of. Um, what I, what I, there's, I had a whole list of questions, but listening to the back and forth, there was, there's some things that I need to clear up. Um, and I guess, for a yes or no standpoint, like I just a yes or no answer, and, and if you want to get into a little bit of detail, that's fine. Are you saying that the film tax, the change from the uh, from a tax credit to incentive, had no impact on the industry, or are you saying that it had an impact on the workable hours of the industry? Um, I, I'll have to give um, uh, a little bit of an answer more than yes or no, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, but the the, the uh, the, the question is, uh, did, the, did the change have an impact? And the answer would be um, the policy shift, uh, it's, it's, it's too early to tell the long-term impact of that. Let's say short term. Pardon me? Short term. But. Short term, there was some period of adjustment as people shifted from one uh, model to the other. There was obviously advocacy that occurred in that period, which took people away from uh, their day jobs. So uh, that would be one potential impact. And the second uh, potential impact, and I, I think this one would, would bear through, if there were jurisdiction shoppers that were simply looking for the best subsidy they can get regardless of locations, talent, anything else. Um, we were no longer the premium high, uh, I guess maybe I shouldn't say premium, we were no, no longer the value producer. We were not competing for that piece of the market, so that would have caused the jurisdiction shoppers to choose to go elsewhere, Manitoba, Northern Ontario would be examples of places where they would have gone. So, so we, we can say that there was an impact short term and we don't know the long term impact. Uh, what has NSBI done to try to uh, assure the individuals in that industry that uh, we are going to support the industry and also to, uh, you know, I think we've had this discussion many times, but some of the best paying jobs in the industry is from foreign films, like foreign investment. Uh, when you get a big Hollywood production or you get a, uh, a large uh, production company coming here to Nova Scotia, uh, they, they sometimes tend to pay a little better and spend a little more money. Um, and what are we doing to assure those individuals that work in the industry and those production companies that are looking for a place to temporarily call home to that we are here, we're open for business, and we will support you. Yes, so there, there are a couple things. Uh, f first of all, um, maintaining regular contact with, with Screen Nova Scotia to get input and have dialogue is number one. So there's a, there's a working group uh, of Department of Business, CCH and NSBI that meets, meets regularly with industry so that the information flows in. Um, second would be uh, promotion of exports because Nova Scotia uh, productions are exports so NSBI has had 22 film companies take advantage of export uh, development programs. Um, the pace at which uh, uh, transactions occur now that NSBI manages the fund is much quicker than uh, the other asp the the former film industry tax credit which was much more prolonged so from efficiency for financing purposes there's uh, there's a dedicated staff there's a quick very quick turnaround so all of those elements would contribute to creating stability but the other the other important question that your that your comments kind of um, invite a, a response to is what's more beneficial for the long-term prospects of Nova Scotia. Yes, a large production coming in using taxpayer subsidy and leaving has a short-term uh, benefit. Wages might be marginally higher, but the long-term benefit, the, the reason that you'd really want to have a broader involvement in the film industry is so that you can build the value chain more completely. So it's not just fly in, fly out, you're developing more permanent attachment to Nova Scotia and creating longer term opportunity and that's, that's where our focus is. So that kind of leads in perfectly to my next question which is, uh, you know, we talk about 
where we have an advantage over some jurisdictions, but we also have a competitive disadvantage uh, when it comes to infrastructure, for example. We've heard this from the industry uh, not just uh, during the changes, but before the changes. That includes, uh, you know, there's been rumors about cultural links, sound studios, uh, uh, production studios, post-production studios, etc. cetera. Um, what is uh, NSBI doing to uh, try to narrow the gap on our competitive disadvantage when it comes to infrastructure, film infrastructure, and who, who are you working with uh, within the industry to assure that any money spent or invested is invested in the right place. Yeah. So it's not just NSBI, although NSBI is an important uh, program delivery point, but the, the Department of Business and the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage um, are regularly interacting on questions like how, what's the infrastructure, strategic economic infrastructure to support our key sectors and cultural industries would be part of it. So you mentioned a culture link. We're looking right now through Invest Nova Scotia, which has an arm's length board, at creating a, a te television production studio space in addition to other cultural infrastructure here in Halifax. So that's ongoing and it involves CCH, Department of Business, and uh, this arm's length body invest Nova Scotia. So uh, there, is, there is a desire so you're actively to working on We're actively trying to narrow working. the gap with our disadvantages when it comes to the film industry yeah, from an there infrastructure are, standpoint? There are, um, as, as your question implies, there's more to competitive advantage than sim simply subsidy. So absolutely infrastructure is on the, on the table. So. Um, the, the way uh, media is being um, brought to the consumer now is changing. We just saw uh, um, Netflix, or no, Amazon, for example, just uh, bid $250 million for The Lord of the Rings. There's rumors that um, the, the TV rights for the Harry Potter will go up to a billion dollars. Um, the, the last year, Netflix spent $6.5 million on uh, original content. I mean, the list goes on and on. We have Apple. Uh, Facebook is now getting into original content. Um, who is actively, or are we actively, seeking out those opportunities? Are, are we in contact with not just the traditional producers, but also the, the streaming services and the uh, services that are now, it looks like, is, is going to be provided? Because I think... I think most of us here probably have some sort of streaming service and, and cable, um, unfortunately, or, fortunately or unfortunately, whatever, whatever way you want to put it. I think cable t television, for example, may be going the way of the dodo bird. Um, so are we actively seeking out this opportunity? Because there is a lot of money being spent by these, by these companies. Yeah. So um, the through CCH support uh, of about 238,000 per year goes to Screen Nova Scotia, and that is uh, the party that uh, advocates for but promotes the the industry as a whole and is thinking strategically about how the, how we can use our competitive advantages here in Nova Scotia. Uh, as your question uh, raises, there is significant disruption in the global industry. Our, the consumption patterns for, for screen media is totally different than it was 10 years ago. And the, the introduction of new players, the ones that you mentioned, have significantly disrupted the industry. But the, the net impact of that is that the demand for content has never been higher. Uh, so the strategic focus of Screen Nova Scotia, um, we, we, we as government don't dictate to them where to focus their attention, but we certainly want to collaborate with them to increasing the strategic competitiveness of Nova Scotia. It, it would be our view that they have kind of the, the lead in determining where Nova Scotia industry can uh, succeed in, in a rapidly disrupting industry. My own view from the Department of Business policy point of view would be um, 
content creation and different kind of content creation. So digital media, which we haven't got into, is something where there's, uh, again, tremendous potential. So, And NSBI's role would be in promoting export growth regardless of uh, specific industry developments. So I do hope that uh, the department and uh, is working with the stakeholders here in Nova Scotia and Screen Nova Scotia to actively seek out some of these opportunities. Like I said, there is a lot of, there is a lot of numbers being thrown out uh, out there uh, and, and while, while we're on numbers I, I must admit that um, I think I think the general public when I have this discussion uh, become confused because everybody has a set of numbers uh, on the economic impacts of the film industry um, forgive me for for not um, knowing the difference here at, or maybe you could just shine a light on on this um, we keep hearing, well, you said earlier, the, the difference between the production spending and the economic activity. Um, I think when we start getting into that, I think the public in general is, gets confused. Uh, so please explain the difference between production spending and economic activity. Yeah, so the, the GDP impact, which, which in our case is, is less than 1% of the province's GDP, would be the total value of goods and services direct and implied and imputed from the, uh, from the production activity. The starting point would be volume of production activity and then economists would, uh, would forecast based on that data what the total impact on GDP is. Um, and in, in Nova Scotia's case, the, the film industry is, is less than 1% of our total GDP, but very important to those in the industry. And just interrupting right quick, but does that include uh, Smith's Bakery that provides goods? Does that, prov that, does that are you including uh, hotel rentals, car rentals, uh, the local mom and pop shop, the antique store? Um, are you including that? Because that is something that tends to get uh, I mean, there is an, like, we can admit, like, I mean, there is an impact on small businesses and there is an impact on um, local shops when a large production, in particular, comes to town uh, and introduces new money into our economy, and that goes directly into the hands of local mom and pop shops, I would, you know. Yeah. So are you including that when you, when you say... Yeah, that, that is included in the, in the calculation. So... Uh, Film alone would be 0.15%, just the film itself, but when you then add in the other impacts, we're getting close to 1% of, of provincial GDP. What, would, what else would you equate that to? Um, you know, the, there, any, any enterprise that has, or group of enterprises that has uh, a volume of, of activity in the $100 million range would be having the same impact. That's it for me. Let's pass it Similar on. impact. Got about 10 seconds, so we'll put okay. it back to the Conservative Caucus. Okay. Or time is just about expired. We'll move back to the PC Caucus. Mr. Tim Houston for 10 minutes. Thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's interesting, much of the discussion, you know, certainly some of the discussion is around, um, it seems like the department's desire to build a cultural enterprise, and that that's may be admirable, but, but I'm really talking about saving an industry and growing an industry. And as a, as a Department of Business, I would, I would like the focus to be as well, jobs, creation of jobs, creation of economic activity, bang for the, bang for the investment that's made. You've been asked a couple times about the employment numbers and how many people are working and are less people working or more people working. <clears throat> Even the Liberal Caucus asked the question and there's no answer from the department. So it doesn't, it doesn't seem like that's been a focus of the department. I think it should be. Uh, I think it should be a focus of NSBI as well. And you also implied in your in your comments about the foreign service productions going elsewhere that you're kind of okay with that. And uh, I'm not okay with that. I, I, I want that that investment here in this province generating further further economic activity. And that's that's really when you when you we're spending as much money. Uh, we're spending as much money on the incentive as we as we did before. But things are, aren't even close to where they were before. So, so the department should be looking at what are we doing, why are we doing it, and how can we make it better? And, and, and the minister indicated, oh, I'm open to, to having chats. And you, you indicated this morning that 
continue to listen and, and, and open, to, open to suggestions. Um, has the industry asked for a larger pot for the incentive? Or have they just asked for changes to the incentive? And, and the second part to that would be, have you made any? Yeah, so we're, we're two and a half years in uh, to the existing program. Uh, we had what I would characterize as the year of adjustment. And now we've got two years of data, 2015, 16, 16, 17, where we see some positive trends. However, um, we, we, we do want to, and, and part of the thinking behind the creation of the fund was adjusted as appropriate. And there is a scheduled review in 2020, 2021, in order to do just that, to make the appropriate changes to continue to build the industry. Uh, on, the, on the first uh, part of your, your prologue, um, uh, you know, very, very fair observation. Uh, and I guess where the Department of Business would come at it is that uh, we do <coughs> want to make our investments wisely. Uh, because we do have limited resources. And we want to have not only the immediate impact, but the long-term impact for the industry. And when Nova Scotians own the copyright of the production, uh, the, when Nova Scotians are the writers, the producers, the directors, the principal actors, there is, it, in our judgment, and, and you're uh, obviously entitled to different judgment than the judgment we bring to it, there's a net better benefit to Nova Scotia and strategies about choices. And in an era of limited resources, although foreign service productions are valuable, uh, comparing net long-term value to the province, uh, there'd be a view that building Nova Scotia copyright ownership, building uh, Nova Scotia indigenous industry will not only have an episodic impact when, when people come to the jurisdiction and leave, but it'll have longer, a longer tail on it and it'll be uh, for the, for the longer-term benefit, attraction, retention of youth, et cetera, that's, so, that's where so we choose to the, the, focus the, our attention. The, the, I guess they're the seven, seven most fearful words in the English language. I'm from the government and I'm here to help. What I'm hearing from you is, is that the department knows better than the industry. So the department is trying to move our Nova Scotia industry to some place where they want it to be. It doesn't matter what the industry wants. This is what the department wants to do. And there are very real, and, and the department can talk all at once about what the program was designed to do or what the program will do. But the reality is, is that we have um, unintended consequences today that need to be dealt with. So, so um, banning smoking indoors, that wasn't designed to litter the streets with cigarette butts, but that's what it did. So when you, when you have unintended consequences staring you in your face and the industry, you're talking to the industry about changes that they want to see made. So are you saying in 2021, maybe some of those, maybe that discussion can really happen in earnest. And in the meantime, we can talk a lot back and forth about some of the changes, but nothing will be done until till 2021. Is that what I just heard? Uh, that, that, that was not the intention of my remarks. The intention of the remarks is continue to work with the industry to build competitiveness. If, if that includes focusing on talent development, focusing on infrastructure, we're very interested in having that discussion. The incentive is one aspect of it. On the question of uh, um, we're from the government, we're here to help, that's certainly not the framework we, we bring to it. Um, at all. Uh, the industry obviously has, uh, has an interest and a very important interest and they also have industry knowledge. Uh, and, and there's also the public interest that needs to be weighed into that. And the public interest comes back to the question about choice of use of limited resources and evaluation over the long term, what's the best investment for Nova Scotia. So it's, it's not our intention to any way come with a sense that we have all the answers or any of the answers, but to bring a frame of reference that recognizes the interest of the industry and aligns as much as possible our policy objectives with the interest of the industry and Nova Scotians more broadly so that we're getting a, a, you know, effective long-term impact as a result of our choices. A couple, couple questions maybe you can just answer for me. Um, um, the industry has asked for the creation of, a, of an equity investment program $2 million a year. It's not in the budget. 
is there any intention to, to move forward with any type of uh, equity investment program? Yeah, in, in the current year, we haven't uh, determined that we would reintroduce an equity program that is precisely the same as what existed <clears throat> before. Uh, but what we have indicated to the industry and what I'd indicate to you is uh, one of the areas of focus uh, for our broader strategy is to increase the rate of enterprise growth in Nova Scotia, including film enterprises. And if we can help startups, mm -hmm. if we can incent people to um, build bus businesses and become entrepreneurial and create value in that way, we're very open to having those discussions. And if part of that includes early stage funding akin to venture capital type funding where you receive it at the early stage but once you've become mature um, you don't rely on it that's a discussion we're prepared to have but there's nothing in the current year budget that would have a reintroduction of an equity program okay okay it's it's interesting the, the industry like you, you quote the statistics of the industry Nova Scotia having one to two percent of the industry and you know, and, and you're taking action based on that. And it would be interesting to see what percentage of the IT industry we have uh, in, that we have, we have in here in Nova Scotia, because it doesn't stop in Novacorp and everyone from making big investments in that, right? So it's it's yeah. it's, it's it's government needs to kind of. Uh, um, Kind of get on the same page on that stuff, I guess. But, but I guess uh, what I what what I would like to know is: Are you able to tell me today, today, what was the actual uh, production volume for 2017, 2018? NSBI should have that from all the reports that people file. So, do you have the actual? You know, we talked about some theoretical numbers uh, going forward. And, 2017, and back from, 18. Yeah. Uh, I have this the CMPA number, which is. Uh, but one, you should have NSBI should have the fund the way the fund operates with the reporting and stuff. You should have an actual number, I would think. Yeah. So one one hundred and two, uh, one hundred two million the <clears throat> for the year ended. Okay. For the year ended twenty seventeen eighteen. That's the. Okay. Now, we did have some talk about uh, what's going on in Ontario and BC and how the industry has some success because of the clusters, uh, the clusters of infrastructure that they have, that they have available to them. <clears throat> and you use that as a reason that their industry is trending up and ours, ours is really not. But we were building a cluster here. We were on our way uh, to building clusters here until the foot got stuck in and the, and, and the runner got tripped there. What do you do? You accept that we were building, we were building mass, we were building a cluster, or do you not accept that? Well, uh, I do accept that the CMPA reported that we had a 200% year-over-year increase in foreign location service production. So that that from a 12 million to a 39 million proportion of our of our production uh, would uh, would tell me that we still have um, growth and opportunity. Okay. And in terms of our niche, identifying what's our strategic competitive advantage and filling that, I, I do believe we have a cluster, but it's not the same cluster that Ontario or BC have. And, and no matter what we did, it never will be. And that's not saying anything other than describing the size of our jurisdiction, the proximity of our jurisdiction, the history of the industry, and where we bring unique advantages which they don't have. Um, so, uh, you Order. know. Time has expired. We'll move to the NDP <coughs> caucus. Ms. Roberts, for 10 minutes. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to your comments about labor and employment. And as I understand your comments, you're saying that we've, we've almost recovered. We're not quite back to where we were in terms of a 10-year average, but, but you think we're, we're, we're getting close. <laughs> and... But, but I am frankly, I'm, I'm confused by that because while um, in, in the witness package on page nine, it shows direct FTEs employed in film and television production in Canada by province and territory. Um, there, there does seem to be recovery from the low year of 2014, 2015, and indeed a greater number than 2015, 2016, according to this. But we have numbers from ACTRA, IATSE, and the Directors Guild, where there was a plummet in 2015, a slight recovery in 2016, which as you yourself pointed out, may have been a lag effect of productions that actually were incented through the, the film tax credit, um, but, but were you know, scheduled for later. 
Um, and then again, a descent in 2017. So I don't see recovery in those three groups. And so I'm wondering who you're talking about. If you're saying that our, our labor numbers are, are up, who is working that you're referring to who is not represented by ATSI, ACTRA, or the Directors Guild? Yeah, so I, I guess it, it would uh, encompass um, everyone else that isn't in those groups, assuming that that data is, is accurate. So the, the data that underlied my comment it was the, the most recent CMPA data, which CAVCO feeds into. And to give you the precise numbers uh, in, in, the, uh, in the CMPA report, the 2012-13 total FTEs in Nova Scotia was 930. In 2013-14, it was 1,160. 2014-15, they report 620, uh, but we don't accept that that's an accurate number. The number was higher in that year. 2015-16, uh, it was 760, and 2016-17, it was 880. So it hasn't resumed the 2012-2013 number of 930. So if we use that as an average year, or we take the total average going back 20 years, we're just, just for rounding purposes, we'd say 1,000 FTEs would be um, you know, a, a standard to, to, to strive towards. In 16, 17, we're, we were at 880 in FTEs, but trending upwards from 760. Well, again, um, ACTRA, IATSE, and the Directors Guild are not trending upwards. Um, they're not trending upwards. So, so are, do those numbers from CMPA, do they include animation? Yeah. 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 My colleague is, is pointing out part, part of the distinction. So CAVCO uh, is kind of the big picture, the global numbers, and what they do is a calculation of FTEs using standard industry numbers based on um, the, the, the investment in the industry. So there's certain assumptions that underlie the CAVCO numbers. Um, the, the numbers that you're quoting would be directly from the, the parties, so that, that's most likely the explanation for the discrepancy. And can you give me a yes, no, as to whether the CMPA numbers that you're use, th that are reported here, do they include animation? Um, I think we'll have to undertake to get to get back, we'll undertake to get back to you on that. Okay. Um, I, I would point out that I think, I think it's, not entirely accurate to say that these numbers, which I do have in front of me, show that we're almost back. I mean, so 2016, 2017, they have 880. In no year from 20, 2007, 2008, which is when these numbers are, are, are presented here, in, in no year were the, the numbers lower than in 2012, 2013, which was 930 in 2008, 2009. It was 1600 in 2014, 2013, 2014. It was it was 1100. Um, so 880. You know, we're, we're still we're still a ways back. That that that's correct. We're we're trending, uh, but we haven't uh, achieved the levels, uh, either the highest level, the lo the lowest level, which was 930. So a 50 FTE difference. Uh, so your your comment is accurate, and I agree yeah. with it. I, I think I think I wouldn't even hazard to call that a trend. Um, would uh, to go back to the question I asked before my time elapsed last time? Is there um, a labor incentive that would work for the Department of Finance? I mean, what I what I've really heard is that the the taxons that we're spending as much money now as we did before. We have fewer jobs. The problem with the incentive, the film tax credit, as as it existed, was that it was it was a pain for the Department of Finance. They didn't know what our um, what our liability was under that program because, like you said, it was back ended. So, is there a direct labor incentive that would work um, that that would allow us to get back to the numbers and and uh, 
yeah, allow, allow these groups, ACTRA, IATSE, Directors Guild, to, to, to see the boost that they have not seen since that um, tax credit was eliminated. Yeah, so I, I'm not in a position to speak for the Department of Finance, so I, I can't comment. I, I would say we're 2.5 years in and we'll continue to maintain our lines of communication and dialogue. And, and the, the additional uh, point I would make is that the industry itself when we were talking to them about the fund, expressed a preference for dealing with the Department of Business or the Department of Communities, Culture and Heritage. And when we look across Canada, the lead departments for film industry is often a business-related department or an economic development department or CCH rather than a um, finance department. Okay. Um, so uh, the industry did have an interest of, of not having finance uh, run the program. I think the dislike was mutual. Um, <laughs> So the equity fund, um, you, you suggested that it wasn't it wasn't targeted sufficiently to support startups, um, but but we know that it was um, a small amount that really helped the industry. And and some of the some of the players that people would know that that access that fund include Tom Fitzgerald, the Trailer Park Boys. Why why? should it be more targeted? Um, and certainly, if there's a need for it to be more targeted, can we just get on that and, and create it ASAP? Sure. Um, we do think that there are points at which companies become mature and they develop uh, you know, a, a, a value, maybe not in their specific production companies, but in their holding company or their parent company. And in terms of those cases, it's not matching need to or objectives and need. But in terms of the overall objective, um, you know, one one scenario, uh, and it happens in the venture capital world, is private sector funding is leveraged, and if uh, the province were able to, you know, provide some seed money that other industry participants, those particularly that have been successful in the industry, uh, wanted to contribute to. There's certainly discussions that we could have about creating an arm's length fund that is uh, seeded by government but leverages private sector money. In the case of venture capital, that's precisely how uh, our indirect uh, financing programs work. The province commits, for example, a number. I won't state a number because it depends on the, on, on the uh, sector and the industry. But then the fund manager goes out and le leverages other money to create a greater pool of equity. So yeah, that's certainly... I mean, as, as I recall from the conversations around the time of the change, in fact, it was... That, that was part of the function of the, the tax credit that was yeah. that was axed. And the, and the Eastling Fund would be another equity program of private money that's able uh -huh. to be used for that purpose. Can I, I have less than a minute. Um, the 2% bonus for, or sorry, 1.5% bonus for um, Nova Scotia principal actors, has, has a production accessed that? Yes, they have. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The time is just about to expire. We'll move to the Liberal Caucus. Mr. McGuire. I just, uh, one last question and then I'm going to pass it on to my colleague. Uh, we hear a lot of questions around incentives, or a lot of talk about incentives and money and uh, jobs, but the number one question I hear from people in the industry, and I guess I'd, I'd like to hear an answer to that today, and the number one question I hear, and rightfully so, is why the change? Yeah, so um, that is uh, you know, a very fair question. And it, it, it does come back to context and the fact that um, the province was facing uh, persistent fiscal deficits. Um, and the film industry tax credit was open-ended uh, and back-end loaded and it was a multi-year commitment for which there was no line of sight. So the, the liability in a particular year could come in and be uh, way beyond uh, what any government, this government or any future government, could have any control over. So primarily the, the shift to a fund introduced a program in which there could be forecasting and there could be certainty. And then um, uh, the, the other aspect would be accountability. Um, because the film ind industry tax credit was uh, a tax measure, 
it carried with it a confidentiality provision that goes along with taxes. Um, but in, in effect, even though it was called a tax credit, it was a grant. It was a grant that was being made uh, to industry, but because it was done through the tax code, it was not visible to the taxpayer. So the uh, additional benefit of the, uh, of the fund is just like the other programs that NSBI uh, operates, it's subject to full transparency and public disclosure. Um, so it's, um, it's clear the, the old program was much more opaque and could not be disclosed uh, clearly to, to uh, the public. So the public had no idea which productions were accessing public money and how, what the benefits or, or losses would be associated with that. So to summarize, it was fund is, is better to forecast. A fund was being used in Alberta and seemed to be a good model. Alberta has 4% of the national industry. Um, it didn't have the risk of, of subsequent year impacts on, on forecasting and budgeting, which would have an adverse effect on core services of government. Thank you. We will now move to Mr. Jessam. You have about seven and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Through you, uh, there are several jurisdictions throughout Canada who have some type of uh, a, a film incentive program, and there are two of them nationally that have managed to, to enable a surplus budget. We're one of them. And I say that because we have a responsibility to uh, manage the, the funds of all Nova Scotians um, to the best of our abilities. And with that said, uh, I mean, we have a responsibility to try and make investments strategically in ways that support every industry. And the film industry is no exception to that rule. Um, uh, there have been several examples of, of, of things that have been highlighted here this morning and programs that I know exist. Um, and if, if I, 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 I believe that I'm clear, the Department of Business, Nova Scotia Business Incorporated, uh, is continually committed to working with the film industry to try and develop and enhance and sustain the industry here in Nova Scotia. I'm wondering if you can talk about some of the, the workings of the programs that exist, for example, at NSBI or labor, what have you, that would complement uh, the work of the film industry in an effort to uh, demonstrate government is willing to, uh, to be as supportive as we have the practical ability to do. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that. So um, the film producers, uh, an important component of their business is to get a distributor, and distributors are often outside the jurisdiction, so they, they need to uh, export or travel to do that. And for two years in a row, film enterprises are the top five, uh, are in the top five of sectors using NSBI's export growth program. So 22 companies uh, were applied and approved for support in the export uh, growth program last year. Um, there would be um, other uh, other supports through uh, you know the the work of, of Ms. Wood and the her colleagues, where um, we're aligning other uh, supports that are available to the film industry as a strategic sector. Um, Programs like the Graduate to Opportunity program would be one where if you uh, have the threshold uh, requirements met, there's opportunities uh, to, uh, to participate in that program. So they have full access to all the small business development programs that are available through uh, NSBI and other government uh, programs. Okay, thank you. And uh, I'd just like to mention that you know I've, I've, I've taken the time to meet with um, a number of people in the industry who would uh, live in my riding, who have expressed, um, I guess, the ups and downs of the industry. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to be able to do that. Uh, I'm also very grateful um, that, you know, because of the passion they've demonstrated to me and the importance that it is to their families that uh, government is doubling the investment in the industry um, in this year's budget. Uh, as 
the representative uh, working with the Premier on the youth file. I'm curious, um, are there any programs or is there any consciousness to uh, attract, retain, I guess, the, the next generation of film workers for the province of Nova Scotia? Yeah, so when, when we look across jurisdictions and we talk about competitive uh, things that government can do or support that will improve competitive advantage. Education, training and development is one of them. So programs through NSCC uh, could very much build the skill sets necessary in order to meet this uh, dramatically changing environment for uh, for film production, content production. So one, one thing we could do, and we'd certainly invite and have further discussions with industry about how can we make sure there's a pipeline of talent um, some jurisdictions use that as a, as a competitive advantage, their education and training programs. Through the uh, Film Fund, one of the Nova Scotia content incentives was to induce or encourage producers to hire Nova Scotia trainees. Mm -hmm. So a graduate of a recent program from NSCC would be incented through this program um, to be attached to a production that it may just be a foreign service production that's coming to Nova Scotia, but if uh, they're meeting their um, principal actor requirements and they hire a couple of Nova Scotia trainees and uh, film 75% of the production in Nova Scotia, that's going to create a valuable career experience for that young person. So I, I think we need to continue to think create, create creatively about how we can do things other than just uh, direct financial incentives to producers um, to build the industry. Not that the direct financial incentives to producers are certainly a piece of the puzzle, but talent, youth retention, and attraction training would all be part of it. Okay, that's excellent to hear. Thank you. And I, I've only got a couple of minutes, but I, I guess I just wanted to highlight that um, there's been a an obvious amount of discussion around the, the changes within the industry, but I think that it's important to, to highlight that uh, we continue to maintain our relative share of the, the production being done in the nation. Um, it's clear to me that there is a relationship that exists out there between government and the industry, and there is an intentional um, there's an intention to to continue to work together with the best interests of the industry in mind, and um, you know, I uh, my hat goes off to the department at the department. My hat goes off to the people working in the industry, and uh, I don't know, that's all I have to say about now. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, the time has expired. Uh, we don't have time for closing comments today. Um, I would like to thank the witnesses for appearing and answering our questions. And um, we have uh, one piece of correspondence from the Department of Environment re regarding information that was requested at our February 14th meeting. Uh, does anybody have any questions or comments on that correspondence? Hearing none, our next meeting is on April the 25th where we will meet, we will have the Department of Health and Wellness and, and the Nova Scotia Health Authority as witnesses to discuss mental health strategy. This meeting is now adjourned.